You're listening to The Taylor Marshall Show, episode 113. Did the Holy Spirit appear as a real dove? Look at what St. Thomas Aquinas says about that. And we'll also look at the St. Raymond non natus, literally in Latin, St. Raymond, the one who was not born, all in today's episode. Howdy, and thank you for tuning in to The Taylor Marshall Show. This is the podcast for everyone who wants to create daily habits and learn enough theology to take their faith to the next level. My goal this week is to answer a question about the nature of the dove at the baptism of our Lord. Remember, a dove came down from heaven. We're going to look at whether that dove was real or symbolic. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. And it's great to be back here at the office behind the microphone. Um, Before I left, we did a podcast about uh, us heading off to Rome. Um, I went and taught for the Rome experience at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross, Sante Croce, which is just um, near the Piazza Navona in Rome, if you know Rome well. And uh, it was a wonderful time. Great seminarians from all over the U.S., from Miami to L.A., I really enjoyed meeting these great future priests of our church. We had a lot of fun. We had some gelato, and we saw the great churches of the holy and eternal city, Rome. Towards the end, and I talked about this in the uh, podcast in the New St. Thomas Institute already, but uh, for those of you that aren't in the New St. Thomas Institute, towards the end, we we had a bunch of pilgrims join us from the New St. Thomas Institute, and that was great to meet them in person. We had a wonderful chaplain, Father Juan Diego, who had been with us for our New St. Thomas Institute pilgrimage to Mexico City to see Our Lady of Guadalupe. He was back with us again in Rome, and uh, just a beautiful time, great weather, great fun, and, you know, we went to St. Peter's. We had Mass in the crypt of St. Peter's. Um, We had Mass in the catacombs. We went to Monte Cassino and had Mass at the tombs of St. Benedict and St. Scholastica. We went and saw the uh, and prayed before the tomb of Padre Pio in San, John, in San Giovanni. Let's try this again. In San Giovanni Rotondo. We also went to see the Eucharistic miracle in Lanciano, which was amazing. This was a, a miracle in which a priest was doubting the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And during Mass, the host turned into the flesh of Jesus Christ and began to drop blood. So we saw the crystallized blood droplets and the host that had turned into the flesh of Christ. Um, Scientists have analyzed it and actually is tissue from a human heart, which we believe, of course, to be the sacred heart of Jesus. We went to uh, Loretto and saw the holy house of Our Lady and where the Annunciation happened. And we went to Assisi, which I think was all the pilgrims' favorite part of the trip. If you've been to Assisi, you know how peaceful, how beautiful it is. Um, Father Juan Diego arranged for us to have Mass in the crypt right at the relics, the altar at the relics of St. Francis, which was very special. We had we went and saw St. Clair. We also had Mass at the Portiuncola with the special indulgence there. And I think during the whole trip, since it was a a jubilee year. I think we counted up that we went through 14 jubilee holy doors while in Rome. So a lot of grace, a lot of indulgence, a lot of fun. Also, you probably remember my family came. Joy came over with the eight children, and that was a very special time, probably one of the greatest times in our marriage and in our family. Um, Our son Beckett had his first communion, um, in the crypt, in one of the crypt chapels uh, below St. Peter's Basilica. And then just an hour or so later, we went to a papal audience, and the Pope took our daughter, Margaret, up into the Pope Mobile and uh, kissed her. And we have it on video. If you haven't seen that video yet, you can go to YouTube. Go to my uh, YouTube channel. It's called Dr. Taylor Marshall. And you can see that video footage um, of them taking... Margaret from my wife Joy and bringing her up into the Pope Mobile and then Pope Francis kissing her and then them bringing it back. And some people have commented and said, oh, they just did that because you prearranged it or they knew who you were. No, not it was totally random. We had tickets for the papal audience 
and we got there a little bit late because we had had uh, Beckett's first communion in St. Peter's before it was open. So we had that prearranged. And so we were late getting into our seats for the papal audience. And when we got there, all the seats were full. Um, there were no seats because there's all of us pilgrims, all the pilgrims kind of spread out and find, found a spot. But for Joy and myself and the eight children, there were no more seats together. So there was no way for us to sit. It was very hot. Uh, I got to admit that I was a little bit upset that we couldn't sit down. The kids were hot. We knew this was going to be a long event because the Pope gives an address and they translate into so many languages. So this is just God's way of showing, as I've said in the podcast before, every setback is really a set up for God to do something amazing. So because we didn't have seats, we had to stand towards the back against one of the barricades. And it just so happened that when the Pope came out, his Pope mobile took a left turn right at the barricade where we were standing. So it, for us, it seemed totally random, but I believe our Lord prearranged it. And then the Holy Father in the Pope mobile, it's kind of a white Jeep, no cover on it. He actually went past Joy holding Margaret, and then they, he saw her in the corner of his eye, and he stopped the Pope mobile and motioned for her to come up, and they brought our daughter up into the arms of the Holy Father. And that was amazing. I mean, the whole day, I mean, first of all, we had a son who had first communion in St. Peter's, which is incredible. But for the rest of the day, Joy and I just kept them looking at each other like, did that really happen? Did the Vicar of Christ take our baby into the Pope mobile and give her a kiss? Um, and he did. So that was pretty neat. And uh, our family just had a great time. The kids were, were well-behaved. There were some other kids and teenagers along with us on the pilgrimage um, from other families related to New St. Thomas Institute. So our kids had friends and people to play with and people to talk with on the bus. And that was really cool, really special. So we're, we're grateful for a great pilgrimage. And we're already talking about more pilgrimages for 2017. So if you'd like to go with us with the New St. Thomas Institute, to maybe we'll go to Mexico City and see our lady Guadalupe again, maybe Rome again. We're talking about the Holy Land, Fatima. Um, everything's out on the table right now. So if you're interested in that, let us know. Um, send me an email, leave a message at New St. Thomas Institute, leave a message for me over on Facebook. Uh, I'd love to hear from you and where we should go next as a group. Um, before we get into the proverb of the week and talking about this question of the Holy Spirit, and whether the Holy Spirit appeared as a real dove, a symbolic dove, a ghostly dove. What was the nature of the apparition of the Holy Spirit when Christ was baptized? And we talk about St. Raymond, the non-born, non-natus. I'll just share some, some personal things. So we're back from Rome. Uh, things are going well. We're getting geared up for the fall semester. Not really a semester, but the fall season of the new St. Thomas Institute. We just had a couple great um, ox talk. That's the other podcast that I do um, for the new St. Thomas Institute. We did one recently on the catacombs, the theology, of the catacombs, the history, of the catacombs, a reflection that I gave um, and theology relating to the agape feast and the early church in Rome. Um, that was an ox talk that was done last month. And then just last week, we did an ox talk on Pascal's wager. You may know of Blaise Pascal, and he set forth a gamble or a wager, which says, you know, if God is really there, he really exists, and you believe in him, well, then you get an infinite payout on the bet, the bet which is life. And if God's not real, well, you just maybe missed out on some fun sin during your life, right? And if God is real, and you don't believe, and you don't follow him, then you have an infinite punishment, hell. And so Pascal says, if you are rational, if you're mathematical, and of course Pascal was a mathematician, he created some of the earliest mechanical computers. Pascal says, if you're mathematical and rational, you will choose belief and love of God. You will become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so we talked about, is that a really... Uh, persuasive argument in Catholic apologetics? Um, is it not persuasive? Are there elements in it that are negative? So we talked about the good and the bad of Pascal's wager. So if you're interested in that, make sure you check out the most recent Ox Talk in the new St. Thomas Institute. Also, 
Um, I recently started Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is a grappling sport. Um, I we finished up the um, the final edition of Sword and Serpent Two. And the name is chosen. Everything is done except for the book cover. So I'm really excited about that. But in the uh, Sword and Serpent 2, and for those of you that are new listeners, Sword and Serpent is the first novel, a best-selling novel that I wrote last or two years ago, a year and a half ago. The the sequel that's coming out has a lot of gladiatorial scenes, a lot of chapters that focus on the gladiatorial games. And so... I've been interested in how that plays out, how that looks, and I've been watching a lot of MMA, mixed martial arts, UFC, to see the the violence and the fighting and the bloodshed that can happen when humans fight other humans. Of course, UFC, MMA doesn't have weapons. It's just fists and elbows and knees. But it does give a good narrative picture for me to communicate on the page so that the gladiatorial scenes look accurate and feel accurate. And in doing so, I got interested in martial arts and in particular ground grappling, which is in MMA, basically almost entirely Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So I've signed up. I've started. My joints are a little bit sore, rolling around. You know, I'm just a, a lowly white belt and I hardly know a thing. And I'm constantly getting played out and constantly tapping out. Um, but it's fun. And I was, I was wondering, I wonder if there's any listeners who are also into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So if you are, I'd love to hear from you. Love to hear your experience. What are you? Are you a blue belt? Are you a purple belt, brown belt, black belt? And uh, whether it's been helpful in your life and um, anything. I just I just love to hear from you if you're into Jiu-Jitsu because it's a new thing that's in my life. Okay, so let's kick it off. We officially enter into the podcast now with our proverb of the week. I haven't done this in a while, so I had to scour through the Proverbs. And as I was doing so, I realized we've covered a lot of the Proverbs. I'd flip around the Proverbs, like, oh, we've already done that one. Well, we've done that one. So I found one that we haven't done, and it's Proverbs 23, verses 19 through 21. It goes like this. Hear, my son, and be wise, and direct your mind in the way. Be not among wine bibbers or among gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. End quote. So this is a bit of a longer proverb. It uh, uses the double parallelism that we almost always see in the Hebrew Proverbs. And in this one, the parallel is wine-bibbers and gluttonous people, gluttonous eaters, it says. And... The writer says, hear my son and be wise and direct your mind in my way. Be not among wine bibbers or gluttonous eaters. And the reason he gives is in the second half here is that the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. The message here is not so much don't be a glutton, don't be a drunk, that's almost, that is assumed that the son knows not to do that. Don't overeat, don't drink too much, don't get drunk. But this proverb goes beyond that and says, hey, don't be among gluttonous people and drunkards. Don't hang out with them. Because if you hang out with people who eat 4,000 calories a day and they're not working out, well, guess what? You're going to eat like them. I found that as I hang out with people who are more healthy, I'm doing this thing called Exodus 90 right now with some buddies, and they're both very fit. Um, One of them is Jared Zimmer, who's on the Maccabee podcast with me. Very fit guys. The other one's Adam. He's a CrossFit guy. I'm inspired. Like I don't want to get fat. I don't want to eat junk food. Because I'm inspired to live a healthy life by being around them and talking about their fitness goals and what they're doing. Same thing with drinking. If you're around people who like to drink, that's their form of recreation. Hey, let's go out and get some beers. Let's go get slammed. I was running a, a, a guy I didn't know, but I was running. He's like, yeah, this weekend I just was drinking with my buddies. It was at like college again. It was awesome. And I was thinking, 
That's not really awesome. You know, getting drunk, getting wasted is not awesome. It's not excellence. And so the proverb today is telling us don't hang out with those kind of people. Why? Because you'll end up poor and in rags. You know, when you get to be my age, so, you know, I'm not in my 20s anymore. I'm inching towards the 40s, right? People who drink a lot aren't cool. Like when you're in your 20s, there's people who are party people and they drink a lot. It's like, oh, he's kind of a cool, you know, extroverted guy or girl. But once you're like 44 and you drink a lot, I hate to say it, but the people who drink heavy in their 40s are kind of like they're basically failures. Like they don't have a lot going on. If you're drinking on the weekends, well, on the weekends, you're not playing sports. You're probably sleeping in a lot. You don't feel well. You're not doing anything that improves your life. No self-improvement, no fitness. You're probably not building a business. You're not being an entrepreneur. You're not investing in your children, not investing in, in your future. You're just wasting, you know, maybe 50. If you're drinking on Friday night and you're sleeping in and feeling awful on Saturday, that's 52 days a year that have been wasted. Your health fails, you get black ring around your eyes, you gain weight. It's just not a good lifestyle decision. I'm not saying don't drink, but I am saying avoid the gluttonous, avoid the wine bibber, the drunkard, as it says here in Proverbs. And I hope, I I know I sound preachy, Uh, it's not my intention, but one last point, and that is we Catholics sometimes like to boast that we're not like the fundamentalist Protestants who say you can't drink, you can't smoke, you can't dance, etc. And so we say, yeah, you know, I'm like a G.K. Chesterton Catholic. I like to drink beer and drink wine or whatever. And I've known Catholics who who do overdrink and do overdo it. And there's almost something in Catholic culture that assumes that getting drunk is not a sin. And it is, in fact, a sin, and it can be a grave sin. Uh, Getting drunk is, as we teach in the New St. Thomas Institute, as we talk about drugs and alcohol, getting drunk is giving up your greatest gift from God other than salvation, and that is your intellect. When you get drunk, you blunt your intellect, you blunt your will. And according to St. Thomas Aquinas in the Catholic tradition, your intellect and your will is what makes you in the image and likeness of God. It's your intellect and will. We don't physically look like God. What we share with God is God has an intellect and a will. We have an intellect and will, and therefore we're in his image. So when you get wasted, you're blunting, you're mitigating your intellect and your will. You can't think right. You can't make right decisions. You are blurring the image of God in you. That's why getting drunk or getting high is a big mistake, and it is counted as a sin. Okay, there it is, Proverbs 23, 19 through 21. We'll move on now to our featured segment, our theological analysis. And that's this question about the Holy Spirit. You remember when Christ was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, the Holy Spirit comes down out of heaven and rests on Christ. And this symbolizes that Christ is the anointed one. He is anointed with the Holy Spirit. In fact, Christos, Christ, is the Greek form of Mashiach, or as we say, Messiah. It means the anointed one. And so this visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit on Jesus of Nazareth proves that he is the Mashiach. He is the Christos. He is the anointed one. But theologians, going back at least as far as St. Augustine, have debated over the nature of this apparition of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of important because early Gnostic heretics would say that Jesus Christ appeared to be a human. He appeared to have a physical anatomical body, but he didn't really have a body because they'll say, well, Christ was God and God can't have a body. So that Christ's body, his flesh, they would say, the heretic Gnostics, 
was really just a ghost or a phantasm or like a hologram. And that if you really understand the true nature of Christ, you would know that he is God of God, and therefore he did not have a physical body. He didn't really eat food. He pretended to eat food. He didn't really go to the bathroom. Um, he didn't really have stomach acid and bodily fluid and saliva and all of those things that we have. That was all just a mirage or an image so that we could be led back to God. Now, of course, the early Catholic theologians and bishops refuted this error and said, no, Christ really has a body. Otherwise, the Eucharist, which we say is the body and blood of Jesus Christ, would be a lie. If Christ never had body and blood, how can we have a sacrament of the body and blood? And so, beginning especially with St. Ignatius of Antioch, we have a refutation of the Gnostics, and they are the Catholics are affirming that Christ really had a body and blood. You could shake his hand, you could feel his hair. When he ate fish, it went into his mouth, and with his physical teeth, he crushed up the fish, and that fish went through the metabolic process through his body just as it goes through our body. He was and is a, well, now he's resurrected. Even before he's resurrected, he was a human with a fully human body, except he didn't have original sin, concupiscence, mortal sin, venial sin. He was a perfect high priest. This raises the question, okay, well, if that's the case for Christ, he was incarnate in a real human body. Well, did the Holy Spirit incarnate and really become a real physical dove with a physical beak and a physical dove heart and dove wings and feathers, and talons, and everything that a dove has, did the Holy Spirit have a hypostatic union? That is, did the nature of dove unite with the person of the Holy Spirit? So just as Jesus Christ assumed a human body, did the Holy Spirit assume a dove body? The reason for the confusion and the debate over this comes from Scripture itself. If you go to the Vulgate, if you go to even the Greek, you'll see that in Luke chapter 3, is that right? Let me make sure I got it right here. Yep, Luke chapter 3, verse 22, and I'll just read the English for you. I'll start at verse 21. This is the English. It was while all the people were being baptized that Jesus was baptized too and stood there praying. Suddenly heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit came down upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. End quote. So it says that the Holy Spirit came down on him in bodily form. In the Latin, you get et descendit spiritus sanctus corporali specie. Sicut Columba in Ipsum. That is, the Holy Spirit descended in a corporal species, like a dove. Corporali specie. Corporali. So in the Latin Vulgate, you see the word corporal. Now, corporal comes from the Latin corpus, it means a body. So bodily form is the right translation in English. So you may say, well, Taylor, what's it say in the Greek? Does the Greek say body? Well, let's take a look at it. We go over to Luke 3, 22, and we see in Greek it reads, kai katabene to numa to agion somatiko ede os peristeron. Okay, and the key word here is somatiko, somatiko, which comes from the Greek word for a body, soma. Somatica means bodily. So the Latin is translating it correctly. The English translation that I gave to you in bodily form corresponds to the original Greek that St. Luke wrote with his quill on parchment, somatico. So within the Catholic tradition, we have enshrined in sacred scripture, in both the Latin translation of the Greek and the Greek itself, the idea that the Dove 
that descended on Christ at the baptism wasn't just a spiritual hologram or mirage, but it was corporal. It was somatico, right? It had a body. So, of course, this, you know, you can see the problem now. Did the Holy Spirit become incarnate in a dove? And if so, where is that dove right now? Okay, so in order to answer this, we have to turn to, of course, you know where I'm going with this, right? St. Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas, our blessed doctor of the church, handles this question in Tertia Pars, that's Latin for the third part, question 39, article 7. He gives three objections. Then he gives an on on the contrary where he quotes St. Augustine of Hippo. Then he explains his answer, and then he refutes the three objections against the proposition that the Holy Spirit had a real body, a real body. So let's work through Article 7, Question 39 of the third part of the Summa Theologiae. Um, Quick refresher for everybody. Thomas always does this in a sandwich format. The top layer is bread, and then there's meat in the middle, and then there's bread at the bottom. The top layer are, are objections that people would give against the Catholic teaching. So whenever we read this top layer, we know it's against what we believe. The meat is where Thomas explains the truth, and then the bottom piece of bread is Thomas refuting the objections that someone would have against the Catholic position. All right, so it's bread, meat, bread. So a lot of people get confused about the bread. That's what the bread is. So we're going to, first of all, look at the meat, and then we're going to come back at the bread. That's how I recommend for new readers of Thomas Aquinas to start. I don't think it's the best way to read it. The best way to read it is the way Thomas did it, meat, bread, meat. But just for simplicity's sake, we're going to go straight into the meat of the sandwich. So Thomas asked the question, whether the dove in which the Holy Spirit appeared was a real dove. And he answers this. On the contrary, Augustine says, Nor do we say this as though we asserted that our Lord Jesus Christ alone had a real body and that the Holy Spirit appeared to men's eyes in a fallacious manner. But we say that both those bodies were real, end quote. Augustine says, look, just as the body of Jesus Christ was real, so the body of the dove was real. That might be a surprise to you, but we're going to see how this plays out. Thomas Aquinas goes on to explain it, and he says, I answer that, as stated above, it was unbecoming that the Son of God, who is the truth of the Father, should make use of anything unreal. Wherefore, he took not an imaginary, but a real body. And since the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth, as appears from John sixteen thirteen, therefore he too made a real dove in which to appear, though he did not assume it into the unity of his person, end quote. So what Thomas says here is that there was a real dove, but that the Holy Spirit did not unite his person with that real dove. So it was not a hypostatic union, as we would say in Christology. There was no union between the dove and the Holy Spirit. There was a union with the body and blood of Christ and the soul of Christ with the divine logos, the second person of the Trinity. Not so with the Holy Spirit and this dove. A distinction's been made. Thomas Aquinas goes on and says, Wherefore, after the words quoted above, St. Augustine adds, Just as it behooved the Son of God not to deceive men, so it behooved the Holy Spirit not to deceive. But it was easy for Almighty God, who created all creatures out of nothing, to frame the body of a real dove without the help of other doves, just as it was easy for him to form a true body in Mary's womb without the seed of a man. Since the corporal creature obeys its Lord command and will, both in the mother's womb and forming a man, and in the world itself in forming a dove, end quote. So clearly, for both St. Augustine of Hippo and St. Thomas Aquinas, this was a real dove that was created 
it might seem, it's not stated here, ex nihilo, out of nothing, or perhaps from something else, but it seems here that Augustine is saying that the dove was not a dove born of other doves. It was just this special dove. I don't know how, what else to call it. Now let's look at the bread. So at the top layer of the bread, we have three objections against this teaching of Augustine and Hippo. The first one says, It would seem that the dove in which the Holy Spirit appeared was not real, for that seems to be a mere apparition, which appears in a semblance. But it is stated that the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily shape as a dove upon him. Therefore, it was not a real dove, but the semblance of a dove. And against that, Thomas Aquinas says, The Holy Spirit is said to have descended in the shape or semblance of a dove, not in the sense that the dove was not real, but in order to show that he did not appear in the form of his substance, the he there being the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't that the Holy Spirit appeared in his substance. Instead, the Holy Spirit chose a dove to represent him, to be a semblance of him. Still, it was a real dove. The second objection against the teaching of Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, someone might say, is this. Just as nature does nothing useless, so neither does God. Now, since this dove came merely in order to signify something and pass away, as Augustine says, a real dove would have been useless, because the semblance of a dove was sufficient for that purpose. Thus, it was not a real dove. So, this objection says, well, look, the dove was symbolizing the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it's enough for the dove to simply be symbolic. Against this, Thomas Aquinas argues, it was not superfluous to form a real dove in which the Holy Spirit might appear, because by the very reality of the dove, the reality of the Holy Spirit and his effects is signified. So Thomas is saying, look, if the Holy Spirit is real, what signifies him must be real, hence the dove. The third objection that someone would say against the teaching of Augustine and Thomas Aquinas would go like this. Objection three. Further, the properties of a thing lead us to a knowledge of that thing. If, therefore, this was a real dove, its properties would have signified the nature of a real animal and not the effect of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it seems it was not a real dove. And Thomas Aquinas counters that objection when he says, quote, The properties of the dove lead us to understand the dove's nature, and the effects of the Holy Spirit in the same way. Because from the very fact that the dove has such properties, it results that it signifies the Holy Spirit. So certain certain properties of the dove, it being white, um, it being a sign of peace, it being beautiful, it being able to fly, all of these things, signify properties of the Holy Spirit. And so since the properties of the Holy Spirit are real, so these features of the dove also need to be real. And there ends Thomas Aquinas on the dove. So it seems kind of like a a silly question, but you can see a lot of theology is drawn from it. One of the questions that I would have for Thomas, and it's not addressed here, is what happened to that real dove after Christ was baptized. Did the dove fly around on earth? Did the dove die? Did the dove cease to exist? Um, What happened to its matter? What happened to its form? Where did it go? None of these things are answered for us. There's a hint of it, however, in um, Objection 2, where St. Augustine is quoted as saying, in order to signify something and pass away. That's Augustine's word. That comes from De Trinitate, um, book two. So it seems that Augustine holds that the dove then just passed away. Um, Kind of interesting. Um, What do we learn from this? Well, we learn that the Holy Spirit did not have a hypostatic union with the dove. We find that in Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, there is this firm insistence that it was a real dove. I think they're afraid that as soon as you grant that the dove was an apparition of a symbolic thing, something that deceives the eyes, deceives the eyes, that that opens the door for the body of Christ to be just a phantom, a phantasm, a 
ghost, a docetic, false body that only seems to be a body, but is not truly the body of Christ. If you'd like to learn more on this topic, we have a couple video, HD video lessons in the New St. Thomas Institute that discuss Christology, discuss a lot of the terminology that we used in this discussion, and also looks at the historical heresy of docetism that denies the physicality of Christ's body. So if you haven't seen those lessons and you're in the New St. Thomas Institute already, please log in and check those out. They're in the Certificate in Catholic Theology under the module called Christology, the Study of Christ. If you're not a member of the New St. Thomas Institute, go check it out, newstthomas.com. All right, Raymond non natus. St. Raymond non natus. Now his name, non natus, as I mentioned before, comes from Latin, non, which means not, and natus means born. St. Raymond was not born. And you may say to me, well, how is that possible? Everyone's born. Everybody has a mother. Well, he was born around 1204, so in the 13th century, this is the same century in which St. Francis of Assisi lived, St. Clare, St. Dominic, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure. Man, if I could live in any Catholic century, I think it would be the 1200s. So we have this great century of the 1200s. St. Raymond is born in 1204. He dies in 1240. Did I just say he was born in 1204? That's a mistake. He was not born in 1204 because he's non natus because he received a C-section. That's right, a cesarean section. You may say, well, how'd they do C-sections in the old days? Well, they cut open the mother's womb, they pulled out the living baby, and the mother died, which is what happened in the case of our saint, Today, St. Raymond non natus. He did not pass through the birth canal. He came out of her belly. And of course, back then, they were able to suture and do stitches. They knew about that. Um, but they did not, in the 1200s, know about, maybe someone knew about, first you have to, to put stitches in the uterus, and then you have to stitch the muscles, and then you have to stitch the skin. But even if they knew how to do all that, they did not have antibiotics. They did not know about the importance of keeping things clean and sterile. And even if they tried such a thing on a mother, um, the infections would be awful and she would die anyway. There are, of course, examples of cesarean, uh, cesarean sections. I want to say cesarean C-sections, but that's a, that's a double up of, of the same word. There are a history of cesarean sections in human history. Of course, the name Caesarian comes from Caesar. It is said that Julius Caesar was born ab utero queso, ab utero queso, cut from the womb, seized, cut, ab utero, from the uterus. And because of that, um, all babies who were born by being cut from the mother's womb, were called a cesarean section. Section meaning to cut, to divide in half. It's kind of neat because the story of Julius Caesar's C-section, Caesar's cesarean, um, spreads throughout the world. So in different languages, like in you know Swedish, um, Hungarian, um, German, Norwegian, Dutch, did I say Dutch already? All these languages, it's referred to a Kaiser and then the word for, you know, a cut or a birth. Um, what's interesting is that in Japan and in Korean, they refer to it, and I, I can't pronounce it, but it's referred to as the emperor's section, emperor cut, a reference to Julius Caesar. Same is true in Poland, Serbia, Russia, everywhere. It's the Kaiser cut, the Caesar cut. Um, so that story of Julius Caesar has spread all the way around the world. And there were people 
who were brought into the world through this method, and one of which is our friend, Saint Raymond. Now, he's a saint not because he came into the world through a cesarean. That's why he's called Saint Raymond non natus, Saint Raymond the not born. But he's famous because of his role with the Mercedarian Order. The Mercedarian Order was founded to redeem Christians from Muslim slave traders. That's right. In the 1200s, in the Mediterranean, Muslims would kidnap Christian children, Christian adults, take them into slavery, brand them, sell them. This was a sex trade. You know, they were looking for these European girls um, that they would sell to Moors and Arabs and Muslims. And this was a big, big business. And so the Mercedarians were an order founded to ransom these Christian captives from the Muslims. And Raymond Nanatus was trained by the founder of the order, who was St. Peter Nolasco. And St. Raymond became a priest and eventually became the master general of the order. He went to Valencia and he ransomed 140 Christians from Muslim slavery. He went to North Africa and he ransomed another 250 Christians. Just imagine if you're just, you know, a Christian teenager, maybe a boy or a girl, you're playing along the coasts of France or in Italy and a Mohammedan pirate ship pulls up and captures you. Or maybe it's late at night and some Muslim pirates grab you at night and the next morning you're on a ship. And then the next thing you know, you're in Tunisia and you're being sold to some dirty, nasty slave owner who's going to do awful things to you. So St. Raymond Nonatus would raise money and he would go and he would buy these Christians back and bring them back to Europe, bring them back to their families. And the Mercedarians had a special vow that if they ran out of money, they would exchange themselves, their own persons, for Christian captive slaves. And so what happened is eventually Raymond himself was enslaved and he was constantly preaching the gospel. And of course, the Muslims did not like this. And so they took a hot iron, a hot pole, sharp pole, and they pushed it through his upper lip and his bottom lip. So they made a piercing. And of course, it automatically cauterized because it was a hot poker. And then he, so therefore, he had a piercing in his lower lip and a piercing in his upper lip. And then they took a padlock and they padlocked his mouth shut. So they could unpadlock it to feed him, but then they could padlock it, and that way he couldn't preach. Eventually, thanks be to God, his order, the Mercedarian order, um, ransomed him and brought him back to Spain in 1239. Of course, his harsh treatment led to his death the following year. So St. Raymond is a man who literally lived the gospel, freeing the captives freeing those who had been ensnared, ensnared, ensnared by the Muslim slave traders. St. Raymond Nanatus, pray for us. Well, before we get to the tip of the week and the Latin word of the week, just a few announcements. This podcast is now available on YouTube, so you can listen to, there's not much to watch because they're audio, but you can listen to the episodes of the Taylor Marshall Show. There's over 100 of them over at my YouTube channel. Plus, there's a lot of videos at the YouTube channel as well for your edification on Catholic philosophy, theology. And I even put up a goofy one recently of me with some buddies flipping tractor tires as a form of exercise. You can see all that and get this podcast at YouTube. Just go to my YouTube channel, Dr. Taylor Marshall. As I mentioned earlier, the sequel to my novel, Sword and Serpent, and all of its gladiatorial um, gore and martyrdom and the glory of early Christian Catholic saints 
bishops, martyrs, and virgins will be available. The title will be announced soon, but you can learn more at swordandserpent.com, swordandserpent.com, and you can download the free study guide there as well. We are um, opening up enrollment at the new St. Thomas Institute. If you'd like to take online Catholic classes with me and join about 3,500 students from 60 nations, we continue to grow. Check out the new St. Thomas Institute at newsaintthomas.com. You can earn a certificate in Catholic philosophy and Thomistic studies, a certificate in Catholic theology, a certificate in Catholic apologetics. And this year, we also have available a certificate in Catholic church history, specializing in the church fathers. Go check it out, newsaintthomas.com. Read some of the reviews, watch some of the sample video lessons, and sign up. We'll see you in the New St. Thomas Institute. Also, uh, I have a free book for you. If you're new to this podcast, go to my website, taylormarshall.com, and you can download the book, Thomas Aquinas in 50 Pages. It's a short, funny, interesting introduction to the philosophy and theology of Thomas Aquinas. It's been downloaded and purchased about 50,000 times. There's also a paperback version at Amazon.com if you want a physical version. Version. Okay, tip of the week. Tip of the week is, you know, sometimes the tip of the week is a book. Sometimes it's a advice on prayer or advice on spiritual reading or spiritual direction or whatever. This week, the tip of the week is a gadget. I'm actually holding it in my hands right now, and that is a Fitbit. My wife, Joy, wanted a Fitbit before going to Italy to keep track of her steps and just to see how much we would be walking. And I honestly thought it was kind of stupid. But I got intrigued by the Fitbit, and she was, you know, reporting how many steps, how many miles she went. And when I was in Italy, you know, I was walking. You know, you can use your iPhone to track your steps and your mileage. And I was, you know, walking, you know, upwards to 10 miles a day, losing some weight, feeling great. And I thought, you know, it'd be really neat to know how I'm doing back home. So I got back home and I decided to make the plunge and I got a Fitbit and I started wearing it. And it was great because it started keeping track of my sleep and then how many times I got up at night or how often I was restless at night moving around. So that was pretty neat. And it would track my steps and it would track my mileage and my floors and my heart rate and all this interesting information. And so I'm kind of addicted to it. Every single day, I'm, I'm looking at it. It's logged into my iPhone. And my wife and I do challenges with one another who can get the most steps. And um, my twin daughters have just started cross country. And we got them a Fitbit. And so now we can have competitions with them. And of course, they're smoking us because they're running and doing all this distance. So it's hard to keep up with them. Uh, but it's kind of a neat deal. So, you know, I, you don't have to get like a super expensive Fitbit. They have less expensive ones, and they're different brands. I didn't do too much research on it. I have the Fitbit brand. Uh, But it's a neat idea, and if you want to know more about your health, more about your mileage, your walking, or even your sleep, check out a Fitbit. We'll leave a link in the show notes um, with the Fitbit that I use. I really like it. It's different than my wife's. I actually like mine better than my wife's. I I don't know what model it is, but we'll look it up. And we'll put it in the show notes at taylormarshall.com. And we'll close with the Latin word of the week. But before we do, I'd like to give a shout out to everyone who has rated this show over at iTunes and also pick a review of the week. So this week, a shout out to the following. We have Flaming Wheel, who wrote a five-star review. Catholic Zach wrote a great five-star review. Thank you, Catholic Zach. I enjoyed reading your review. And also, Junior JR um, also wrote a great five-star review that was lengthy, and I really enjoyed reading that one. But the, the winner this week went to Greg Newmaster, and Greg wrote a five-star review that I, I also liked reading. But I liked it because he talked about his own personal journey, and i like to read you that review now. Greg writes in the review, About seven years ago, I became disenchanted with the Roman Catholic Church, and left bitter and sad. I felt ashamed that I could ever be a part of such an institution, 
The scandal of the church crumbled my faith in her and left me stranded in the sea of secularism. I hit some serious lows around that time, but by the grace of God, I was rescued by some very loving Protestant Christians. God renewed my faith and sent me on a new journey of rediscovery, which led me back to the Catholic Church. By stumbling upon the great teachings of Dr. Taylor Marshall, Dr. Scott Hahn, Catholic Answers, and the awesome Bishop Robert Barron on YouTube, I fell in love with the beauty of the Catholic Church again. Though my story is much more complex than this short summary, I want to thank Dr. Marshall for his theological perspective and testimony. He is a fine systematic theologian with a pastoral heart that shines through his teachings. I encourage anyone who is seeking to deepen their understanding of our rich, historical, and beautiful faith to listen to his show. You won't be disappointed, and you might just learn a thing or two. God bless you, Taylor Marshall, and may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. Greg Newmaster, thanks so much, man. That is a, a beautiful testimony. I'm glad you found your way back to the church. And, um, of course, I'm just really humbled by the words you said, and, and it's a, a good reminder of me to continue to make these podcasts and to do whatever I can to help people understand the beauty and the glory of being a Catholic. So, Greg Newmaster, thanks so much. That is definitely the review of the week. And if you'd like to leave a review, maybe just a quick thought, um, you can leave a review, one star to five star, whatever you think this show deserves. Just go to, just a second here, let me look it up. Go to taylormarshall.com, taylormarshall.com forward slash shout out. And you can leave a rate, rating there. It takes about 40 seconds. It's very quick over at iTunes. And it's a big deal for me because it helps people find this show on iTunes. iTunes, the number one hub for finding podcasts. So when you go into iTunes and you search religion or Christianity or apologetics or Catholic, whatever that is, whoever has the most reviews and the more, most action there gets recommended. And of course, I always want people to find this show. So if you want to help other people, random people in the world, find this show and learn more about Catholicism, I'd really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes and leave a review. And the easiest way to do that we set up a way to, for you to do that. Is go to taylormarshall.com forward slash shout out. Forward slash shout out. Shout out is all one word. So thanks so much for leaving a review. I really do appreciate it. And I look forward to reading your name on the next podcast. Okay, our Latin word of the week to close up is a word that comes from the Vulgate verse about the dove descending on Christ. And it refers to the voice of God the Father over Jesus Christ. And that Latin word for voice is vox. V-O-X. Vox. It's where we get vocal, as in vocal cord, vocal prayer. And one of the, I guess, holdovers in English is you'll sometimes see vox populi or vox dei. The former means voice of the people. The latter means voice of God, vox dei. It's D-E-I, and you pronounce that not as day, as in have a nice day, but dei. In Latin, you always pronounce all the vowels. You don't, well, unless it's a diphthong. Well, we won't get into that. So, But in this case, you say vox dei, voice of God. And sometimes you'll see that um, in writing, especially older papers, older books. Sometimes you'll see voice of God written as Vox Dei. So may the voice of God continue to speak to your conscience, into your mind, into your heart as you grow closer to him. Uh, as we've done in the last several podcasts, we've had listeners um, request that I close the podcast with a prayer. And so I've put together just a very simple prayer. Um, and I'd like for you, if you'd like to pray along with me, it's just a prayer of contrition, asking God for forgiveness and then asking God to come into our hearts, and then, of course, asking God through the Holy Spirit to use us to bring His mercy and His gospel to other people. So if you like, while you're listening, while you're driving or working out, you can pray this along with me. No obligation, but here goes. Gracious Father, you love me, 
your son Jesus Christ died for me, and in gratitude, I want to know you and love you in the depths of my broken heart. Because of your kindness, I repent of my sins. By the fire of your Holy Spirit, allow me to have a deep, personal relationship with you and to draw other people into your love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, may y'all have a wonderful week. Be blessed. May the Holy Spirit, who once appeared in the form of a dove over our Lord Jesus Christ, may the same Holy Spirit make his home in your heart and kindle a great fire that will burn throughout the world. And remember, our Lord Jesus Christ said that you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. Factum es aut cum bapticiare tor omnis populus et Jesum baptizatur et orante apertum es celum et descendit spiritus sanctus corporalis species cum mit et vox de celo factus es tu es filius meus selectus in te campus.